So thank you, everyone, for coming. It's nice to see some familiar faces uh, and some new faces. <coughs> so as Meta mentioned, my background is actually uh, more of a bottom-up look at international criminal law. Um, and today, I'm going to be doing a bit more of a top-down look, uh, integrating um, some issues that have come up recently and questions that I often get when I say that I specialize in international criminal law. I often get, so why can't we stop these conflicts, right? So we have the Ukraine, um, and the blue and red map show uh, the language spoken just as sort of a proxy for what uh, sort of um, identity politics are at play. The red is Russian speaking, um, the blue is Ukrainian speaking, and right now we have the annexation of Crimea and ongoing incursions into Ukraine. Why can't international criminal law stop this? Doesn't this look like a clear act of aggression, right? A foreign country invading another country's boundaries. Um, so that's one question I often get. Another question um, on the top left you see, or sorry, on the top right for you is Syria, right? So you have a ruler using horrible weapons and violence against his own people. Uh, and why can't this man be stopped, right? We have an international criminal court that was specifically set up to stop leaders from this kind of violence. We have doctrines such as responsibility to protect, uh, which means we should be able to possibly invade countries where the leaders are doing these kinds of atrocities to their people. Why can't we stop um, al-Assad? Down on the left is an image of an American soldier in Iraq. Right? We've been um, in a military occupation in Iraq since 2003. Clear violations going on there. Um, a war of aggression, it looks like, as well as ongoing war crimes. Why can't we hold anybody accountable from the United States uh, and other nations that participated in that invasion? And finally, on the right, we have Gaza, where over the summer, over 2,000 people were killed uh, due to Israeli bombs in retaliation for attacks from Gaza. So why, what, what, what's going on here, right? Since um, World War II, there's been an attempt to codify law to prevent this kind of atrocity. Why isn't it working? So that's the sort of thing I want to talk about today, okay? So in order to understand international criminal law, it's important to have an understanding of the who, okay? Who can be held accountable under international criminal law? The what, what count as international crimes? When? When can we prosecute? When should we prosecute? Where? Where should the tribunal be? What's the venue that we should do the prosecution in? And why? What is actually the goal of international criminal law? Okay? So, in order to understand these various components of international criminal law, it's important to understand the genesis of uh, international criminal law. So, one of the first things to think about is the difference between international and domestic law, specifically criminal law, okay? So in domestic criminal law, there needs to be an actus reus. There needs to be a specific act that we're saying is wrong. And moreover, we need to prove a mens rea. We need to prove the intent to commit that act. The dilemma in international criminal law is that the crimes that we're talking about are so horrendous and massive that it's very difficult to prove that an individual had the intent for all of those crimes to be committed, or you could call them violations, right? Crime is a legal term, but all of the human rights violations that we see. How do you prove that one person intended for that to happen? So international criminal law has tried to come up with ways to solve this problem, and we'll talk about that. The next thing is international criminal versus international civil law. So international civil law tends to deal with tort law, civil claims, money exchanges, and it's often used to regulate corporations that profit from human rights violations. In the United States, we have the Alien Tort Claims Act, where a company that's profited from human rights violations can be sued, and that's often used to deal with human rights abuses. The idea of international criminal law really developed to hold individuals accountable and oftentimes state leaders. Okay? So these are people that previously uh, had immunity under international law. International humanitarian law is one of the most important uh, precursors to international criminal law, and I'm just going to give you a little background on that because oftentimes people mistake international humanitarian law for international criminal law. Okay? The international humanitarian law 
is the law of war, okay? And it developed originally from ideas of piracy and slavery, but it really came to the fore uh, during the Battle of Solferino at the end of the um, 1800s when the International Committee for the Red Cross formed and tried to codify the laws of war. And the idea was to balance med uh, military necessity with humanitarian needs, with the human cost of war, with the human suffering. One of the limitations of international humanitarian law is that it ought, was codified to apply to international armed conflicts, right? And this becomes important when we think about Syria, right? Humanitarian law was for international armed conflicts. Uh, but, so two things about that that have changed, okay? So what is an armed conflict, okay? And what counts as international? Over the past 100 years, people have seen that the idea of international is, is increasingly irrelevant when it comes to these mass human rights violations. And so there was an additional protocol that was added to uh, the humanitarian law conventions, which are called the Geneva Conventions, to basically say that internal armed conflicts also can be protected under international humanitarian law, meaning that civilians in countries that are involved in conflict can still be protected under international humanitarian law. However, it only applies to situations that are near or at the level of a full-scale civil war, right? So humanitarian law isn't supposed to apply to anything. It's supposed to be these really high-level armed conflicts. Moreover, uh, the issue in international humanitarian law uh, is that it really is supposed to only cover a particular group of actors. And those are people who you could consider um, military actors, right? So the rules are, I'm going to do some legal stuff, right? What are the rules? You have to have a responsible command structure, control over territory, such that the insurgency can operate sustained military operations, and the ability to implement the protocol. What does that mean? We're trying to protect insurgents. We're trying to understand what constitutes a full-scale civil war, which actors are, group, are powerful enough as a group to be protected under international humanitarian law. Now, international criminal law is intimately tied to international humanitarian law, but we have to understand some of the differences, right? And what are the differences, right? These differences have developed through the codification of international criminal law. And international criminal law first really developed in the wake of World War II. Now, there were trials prior to World War II for leaders uh, who engaged in um, wars that other people in the international community said were wrong. World War I uh, is a classic example. But they didn't really go anywhere, and they were relegated for do to domestic tribunals. And those domestic tribunals had their own interests. So World War II is really when we saw the start of international tribunals taking on this issue of hum human rights violations that occurred during war or international armed conflicts at that time. And the goal of the World War II tribunals were uh, deterrence and retribution, okay? So the goal was to prevent a future war like World War II and to punish the leaders. What, uh, what, uh, what emerged from discussions in the post-war period at the creation of the tribunal, and, and we can talk about the history of the tribunal, um, it was very contested what to do with the leaders of uh, Nazi Germany. In fact, uh, the original plan was to shoot them. Well, there was a big plan to just shoot all of the leaders um, by a man named Henry Stimson. And that got publicized, and then there was a fight between Stimson and Morgenthau, uh, who were leaders in the government of the United States over what we should do, and a consensus emerged we should actually try these Nazi leaders for the atrocities they committed. And they wanted to do it along some principles. And these principles were radical at the time, okay? The first principle, any person who commits an act which constitutes a crime under international law is, responsi uh, is responsible, therefore, liable and liable to punishment, all right? So this is individualizing guilt, okay? That was one of the big innovations of international criminal law. Individuals are going to be held responsible now. Principle two, the fact that internal law, meaning domestic law, does not impose a penalty for an act which constitutes a crime under international law does not relieve the person who committed the act from responsibility under international law. Now, what's that about? In Nazi Germany, everything the Nazi leaders did was legal, right? And after the end of World War II, again, the international powers, 
the Allied, the leaders, really, the, the winners of the war, said, we don't want to allow the Nazi leaders to be able to get let off the hook because it was legal in Germany. There's something worse that they did, and we need to figure out a way to punish them. Principle three, the fact that a person who committed an act which constitutes a crime under international law acted as head of state or responsible government official does not relieve him from responsibility under international law. This was huge, right? So a head of state can no longer claim immunity. And that was sort of the common practice in the international legal system until this time. Principle four, the fact that a person acted pursuant to an order of his government or of a superior does not relieve him from responsibility under international law, provided a moral choice was in fact possible to him. A moral choice, right? So if somebody is holding a gun to a soldier's head and saying, you must commit this atrocity, the person could say, well, I shouldn't be held liable. Other than that, you have a responsibility. This is where the idea of conscientious objector sort of enters uh, the discussion. This also is a principle um, that we now see all the time in international criminal courts that uh, we'll talk about later about command responsibility. Can, did you have control? Could you have said no? Um, principle five, any person charged with a crime under international law has the right to a fair trial on the facts and the law, right? So they wanted to create a system at the international level that replicated Western liberal legal models. That was a big goal of the Nuremberg uh, principles. Principle six, there were three crimes that Nuremberg tried. The first crime was the crime against peace. That's what we call a war of aggression. A crime against peace consists of two things under the Nuremberg principles. The planning, preparation, initiation, or waging of a war of aggression, or a war in violation of international treaties, agreements, or assurances as well as participation in a common plan or conspiracy for the accomplishment of any of the acts mentioned under number one. So those in my uh, international criminal law class know that I love this idea of conspiracy that has sort of emerged uh, in international criminal law. The idea here was pretty radical. You wouldn't just be punished for launching a war of aggression, which is essentially any invasion into another sovereign nation that wasn't under self-defense. Right? It's basically, you can think of war of aggressions in the negative terms. It's not a war of self-defense. Otherwise, it's a war of aggression. Right? And the entire purpose, really, of the Nuremberg trials was to punish the Nazi leaders for the war of aggression. They didn't really care about the other stuff. Right? Um, the second, uh, although they did have these other, these other crimes, there was war crimes. Right? And this is where we see international humanitarian law. Okay? War crimes are violations of the Geneva Conventions. They're violations of international humanitarian law, okay? What does that mean? So the Nuremberg principles tried to lay it out, right? It includes, but is not limited to, murder, ill treatment or deportation to slave labor for any other purpose of civilian population of or in occupied territory, murder or ill treatment of prisoners of war or persons on the seas, killing of hostages, plunder of public or private property, wanton destruction of cities, towns, or villages, or devastation not justified by military necessity, right? So we're trying to say, again, we're codifying what we can do in war. If you're outside of it, you violated the rules of war, and we want to hold you individually liable for violating them. Um, those are, sorry, those are war, yeah, those are war crimes, okay? So that war crimes are violations of the laws of war. Then the third one that, that was emerged in the Nuremberg Principles was crimes against humanity. Crimes against humanity are murder, extermination, enslavement, deportation, and other inhumane acts done against a civilian population, and this is an interesting thing, or persecutions on political, racial, or religious grounds when such acts are done or such persecutions are carried on in execution of or in connection with any crime against the peace or any war crime. Let me, let me put that in lay terms, okay? So if you launched a war of aggression, then all of this other stuff you did was bad, okay? So if you didn't launch a war of aggression, right, if you were sort of doing this in self-defense, then all of those acts that we would consider crimes against humanity aren't so bad. But if you launched a war of aggression, this was bad. Now, why was this so important in the Nuremberg Principles? They were trying to avoid what we call a to coke argument. They were trying to avoid the Germans saying, well, you did it too, right? So they basically tied the Nuremberg Principles to Germany. 
right? The entire, the entire apparatus of international criminal law at this moment in time was to make sure Germany and only Germany was liable for what happened during World War II. Furthermore, as they codified international criminal law, especially around the idea of aggression, they were really, really careful not to, uh, not to in any way implicate what France had done in Algeria, right, or Britain had done in, in India, right? So nothing, no colonialism, right? So any sort of acts tied to colonialism were also meant to be excluded from international criminal law. It was really, we want to say what Germany did was wrong, okay, and it was wrong for these reasons. Anything noticeably absent from those principles? Uh, genocide, right? Genocide is notably absent, okay? Uh, you saw in Crimes Against Humanity, right, that idea of persecution based on political, racial, or religious grounds, okay, that eventually became genocide, right? We now consider that to be uh, genocide only if that is to wipe out the entire population, all right? So the core crimes from the Nuremberg principles uh, and the Nuremberg trials are what we now consider international crimes. So when you talk about what a country can be liable for, it has to be one of these international crimes. Uh, these are called the core crimes, the four that I showed here. They're called the core crimes now because these are what the International Criminal Court has codified. The uh, genocide, I'll go over that quickly because it's distinct, right? Um, genocide was codified in the Convention of 1948. An individual criminal responsibility for genocide requires some underlying actus reus, right? You have to have the basic act. And that, has, that involves killing or causing serious harm, inflicting conditions of life calculated to bring about physical destruction, imposing apartheid, is also considered genocide, etc., against, and this is key, a group or members of a group. And groups are defined as, quote, national, racial, ethnic, and religious groups, okay? The definition of those groups, let me say that again, national, racial, ethnic, or religious groups, you see this also in refugee law. It's basically immutable characteristics, right? We don't want to say that killing people who could change uh, is genocide. So this becomes really important when you look at the killing of political opposition, right? So the Khmer Rouge tribunals in Cambodia. Right? Was that a genocide? One of the arguments is, well, it was the intellectuals. Does that constitute a group under the Genocide Convention? It's being tried that way, but this is a really hot topic. Um, I work in Colombia there. It's, there's the leftist guerrilla leaders, right? The communists are trying to say that a genocide was perpetrated against them. All right, so this becomes really important in international criminal law. And basically in genocide, you have to have a particular intention, right? We call it a special mens rea. Okay, to destroy in whole or in part an entire group. That's really important in genocide. Now, crimes against humanity has really evolved over the years. And it's evolved over the years in relation to the various um, massacres and, and mass human rights violations that we've seen. Right, so um, in uh, basically the crimes against humanity is broader than genocide because there's no requirement of special intent. However, what you need to show is a generalized and systematic attack, right? That's really important to crimes against humanity. Remember, we're trying to make international crimes at a different level than just regular crimes. So the idea that they're of a generalized and systematic attack is really important, right? So the attack threshold uh, isn't actually, and this is important, right? This idea of armed conflict that we saw in humanitarian law, actually crimes against humanity is broader Right? So a campaign of repression by a government against his citizens right, could be considered a crime against humanity. It doesn't have to be in the context of an armed conflict. Crimes against humanity are a little bigger. All right, so it's oftentimes, um, we also don't see this tied to persecution based on national, political, ethnic, racial, or religious grounds anymore. And that has to do with the violence in Rwanda and Sierra Leone and other places where the violence was, uh, it was a little bit different. Sorry, it, the uh, ICTR, the Rwanda definition, was tied to that because it was a more genocidal in terms of a specific group. But Sierra Leone and other violence was more broad-based. And so the crimes against humanity has evolved to not be related to discrimination based on um, particular uh, social group features. Um, the crime of aggression. So the crime of aggression has changed significantly. Okay, so um, the crime of aggression uh, is basically, 
um, very difficult to enforce now, um, and that's pretty much ever since the Cold War. Okay? So there's been a big gap in international criminal jurisprudence that started with the Cold War, although there's some efforts in the scholarship to revive uh, what went on during the Cold War, but sort of the general history is that the Cold War made it very difficult to come to an agreement on aggression, uh, and it's because it's highly, highly, highly political, right? Who claims what a political boundary is? Uh, and um, for example, some would uh, label the bombing of Kosovo and Serbia um, in 1999 an act of aggression, right? But for others, that was humanitarian intervention. Um, in the fall breakup of the former Yugoslavia, there were questions over whether um, Bosnia, Croatia, Slovenia declaring independence were really independent nations. So did the other nation actually cross a national border? It is inherently political, that issue. Uh, and in fact, Richard Goldstone, who was the, um, the head of the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia, basically did not want aggression in the International Criminal Court statute. Because he said that aggression was so inherently political that he would have never had legitimacy to do what he did if aggression had been in that statute. So that one is a really difficult one. And it's really interesting because it was the core of Nuremberg. And now it's sort of fallen by the wayside. And I'll get back to that when we talk about the International Criminal Court. Um, war crimes, again, uh, war crimes continue to be defined in relation to the Geneva Conventions. Okay, so this is violations of international humanitarian law. All right, so these are, these are the crimes. These are considered the core crimes of international um, criminal law. So if the acts don't rise to this, we can't actually do anything about them. All right, so then there's a question of when we shall engage. Um, so this comes up with the idea of victor's justice, right? So do the winners get to do it? Um, Nuremberg is a classic case of victor's justice, right? The Allied powers put the people on trial after the war, all right? Um, the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia took place, the tribunal was set up during the conflict. It was set up in 1993. The conflict didn't end. The Dayton Peace Accords weren't signed until 95. All right, so you see right away with the ICTY uh, the sort of political player that uh, international criminal tribunals begin to play. The International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda was formed after the genocide um, ended, and it actually, uh, the government of Rwanda pushed for the uh, tribunal, um, and it happened after. And it's another sort of victor's justice story when you think about when these tribunals uh, came about. I'll talk more about Rwanda. Then where to ensure justice? Uh, one of the big issues in international criminal law is do you do it in the country? Do you do it outside the country? What are the trade-offs, right? So in Yugoslavia, um, it was the Yugoslavia and Rwanda tribunals were took place outside of the country, right? So the Yugoslavia tribunal was in The Hague uh, in the Netherlands. The Rwanda tribunal was in Arusha in Tanzania, okay? Um, pluses and minuses, right? Pluses that you could argue it's safer, you could argue it's more neutral. Minuses, uh, the outreach programs really needed to do something more than they did to make it relevant to the people in those countries, right? So the, the, they're not seeing the tribunals, it's far away, it's staffed by foreigners, so the people in the country are saying, whoa, what's this have to do with us? The Special Court for Sierra Leone uh, took place in Sierra Leone, um, uh, which caused, uh, which had its own issues, but it was more local. Uh, the special court, the special tribunal for Lebanon um, is another international tribunal, um, and its offices are in The Hague. It's, it's located in The Hague, um, although there's an office in Lebanon, and the ICC, uh, the International Criminal Court, is far away. All right, so where to ensure justice is sort of an issue as well. I'm not going to touch upon that as much, but I'm going to touch upon why. Okay, so if we're gonna do actually a critical assessment of international criminal law, when we look at sort of its evolution since World War II and the Nuremberg Principles, which I present as sort of the goal, right? What was the point? The why becomes really important. Now, why should we have international criminal law? Well, one, retribution, two, an accurate historical record, and three, deterrence. And if I'm going to assess international criminal law, I'm gonna ask to what extent does it actually fulfill these goals? Right? This was sort of the goal um, in creating international criminal law. We want to punish people. We want to get an accurate historical record. We don't want this to happen again. All right? um, and I'm going to use Yugoslavia and Rwanda to sort of talk about the retribu retribution in Yugoslavia. I'm going to talk about Rwanda to get at the accurate historical record. And I'm going to talk about the International Criminal Court to talk about deterrence. 
All right, so the former Yugoslavia, okay? Just give you a sense of the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia. This tribunal was very important in the development of international criminal law. As I said, after World War II, international criminal law was uh, sort of on a lull. There wasn't much action at the international level, mostly because you couldn't get Russia and the West agreeing on anything, right? And so nothing's happening. Um, by the end of the 1980s, right, we have the end of the Cold War, and you have more movement around um, uh, sort of international consensus, okay? And you have something just terrible going on in Europe, right? In Europe. Uh, and a question of what to do. Okay, so the former Yugoslavia. This was a country um, that emerged after World War II. Okay, so Yugoslavia was a kingdom after World War I, but it was recreated as a socialist state after World War II. And there were constituent republics, okay? There was Bosnia, Herzegovina, Croatia, Macedonia, Montenegro, Serbia, and Slovenia. Serbia also had two autonomous provinces, Kosovo and Vojvodina. But so you basically have a republic. And when I teach people who don't know anything about it, especially in the United States, I'm like, think of them as states, right? Think of them as states. Think about California declaring independence and Massachusetts saying we don't like that. Right? So, you know, but you basically have these republics that became less and less and less um, close tied together, right? So, over the course between 1945 and 1980, there were arguments between them, and so the government decentralized and gave more and more power to the different republics. So, they had a lot of power. Uh, they're divided ethnically. So, to the west, you have mostly um, Catholics. Okay, um, Croatia, if you say Croat, you're usually referring to Catholic. Um, to the east, we have Serbia, which usually the Serbs are Orthodox. Um, and the history of the, of the area, which is right across from Italy, on the other side, we've, you know, we've got, this is where East meets, east meets West. It's an incredible place. And when the Ottoman Empire came in, they forced many people to convert to Islam and introduced Islam to the region. Uh, and from the Serb rhetoric, right, the idea of the Serbs was that we were forced to live under Ottoman rule, under the Muslims, and this was terrible, and we were oppressed. Um, and, uh, and there was always about a lot of anger over that. Uh, and Kosovo is where there was a battle um, in the 1400s when sort of Serbia fell and, and the country was taken over by the Ottoman Empire. Now, the different colors here are to represent the different ethnic groups. And um, if you can see, Bosnia and Herzegovina is quite mixed, okay? Serbia is a little more uh, who it is, Croatia is a little more who it is, but Bosnia and Herzegovina is really mixed, okay? And uh, when in 1980 the socialist leader Tito died, nationalist parties started popping up, uh, and there was a lot of fear because in World War II, the Croatian uh, Ustasi aligned with the Nazis and persecuted the Serbs, as well as the Jews, as well as the Roma. And in 1980, when the nationalism started to rise, there was, uh, again, this fear that if these different republics declare independence, they were going to persecute people of the opposite ethnic group. Okay? So I don't want to simplify the history too much, but I need to for time. Eventually, a war broke out as the different republics started to declare independence. And the war was the absolute worst in Bosnia and Herzegovina. It lasted just six days when Croatia declared independence. First Slovenia, then Croatia. Montenegro, it was no big deal. Um, or sorry, Macedonia, it was no big deal. Um, but when Bosnia uh, declared independence, it was a big deal. And um, in 1993, the Bosnian Muslim government was besieged in the capital of Sarajevo. Um, the Bosnian Serb forces, right, you see in the, in the, the purple in Bosnia-Herzegovina were the Serb forces. And basically, when the Muslim government declared independence, the Bosnian Serbs said, we don't want to live under you, and they declared a war against the Bosnian Muslims. And they tried to break up the country, all right? And there was a siege on Sarajevo for three years, and in 1995, the war ended, and there was uh, a peace deal. Prior to that, in 1993, the UN Security Council established a tribunal, okay? And um, it basically was supposed to prosecute grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions. It had no authority to prosecute aggression or crimes against the peace, 
right? Because this was a very strong political question. When Bosnia declared independence, was it an independent country? When Serbia, did, did, was there actually aggression? Not clear. And if the ICTY had said we were going to prosecute aggression, it would have been taking a clear political stance. Okay, so this is just to show you how the evolution of the crime of aggression has fallen by the wayside to explain current conflicts. Okay, so um, the, the, uh, the ICTY here um, did two things that were really important. It came up with this idea of vicarious liability. Um, and it really started to codify who could be held liable, okay? The first type is called, um, is, are people who were just sort of part of the military, right? Liability for planning, instigating, ordering, committing, or otherwise aiding and abetting in planning, preparing, or the execution of a crime, right? So anyone who is involved, right? This is a really broad standard. How do you decide who's actually responsible for the crimes that were committed, okay? And two, um, the superiors are going to be held liable. So again, in international criminal law, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the leaders. We don't want just the low-level commanders that actually did the shooting. We want the leaders, right? And so the ICTY was really important in developing this idea of who could be held liable under international criminal law. What they did that's really important is they developed this idea of joint criminal enterprise, okay? Um, and Essentially, if anyone knows anything about conspiracy in domestic criminal law, this idea is conspiracy in international criminal law. The main difference is that in domestic criminal law, conspiracy requires a meeting of the minds, okay? Meaning that you needed to agree with your co-conspirator on the crime. There needs to be shown that you and that person had a meeting of the minds about what was going to happen. Joint criminal enterprise, you don't. This is often called guilt by association. Right? The idea is that if you were involved with people, right, if you were involved in a military campaign, and it was foreseeable that that military campaign was going to rape and pillage and put people in concentration camps and commit massacres that we could call genocide, you could be liable for genocide. Right? You individual could be liable for genocide, even if you didn't mean it. Right? So they broadened the idea of liability very broadly. Right? So the idea was to get accomplices as principals. Okay, leaders, people who were involved in the military campaign, we want to get those individuals, okay? And if you see, these are, the, these are the sort of definitions. This is called Joint Criminal Enterprise 3. I don't want to get too technical legal, but it becomes really important when talking about the pushback against international criminal law, okay? Because you basically are saying that uh, the possibility of the commission of the specific crime was foreseeable. Right? And the commission of the crime was a natural and foreseeable consequence of the execution of the common plan. Right? Basically, were you part of this group? Did they talk about expelling the Muslims? Whatever they did to expel the Muslims, then you're liable for. Right? The common plan is get the Muslims out of this territory, and you, individual, are liable for your friend over there who did the, whatever it took to get the Muslims out. Okay? So it really, in, in terms of anyone who knows domestic criminal law, really broadens the idea of who can be held responsible and creates all sorts of problems. Okay? Well, what we're seeing right now at the International Criminal Tribunal is exactly that. We're seeing a lot of problems. So the tribunal was set up in 93. Its first cases were in 96. It's been going on since then. And uh, right now, there's been well over 100 cases at the Tribunal for Yugoslavia. And recently, there have been two, there have been three, but I'm going to talk about two very high profile acquittals at the Tribunal for Yugoslavia. Okay? Um, and these acquittals sort of show why we're in a bit of a crisis in international criminal law right now when it comes to retribution. So the first one I'm going to talk about is this man, Gotovina, here on the left. Um, he was a famous Croatian general. He's considered a hero in the war. Now remember, when the Yugoslavia broke up, you basically had Croatia declaring independence. And um, at that time, there was a small area in the Kraina, in a, in a region called the Kraina, where the Serb population, because there were Serbs living in Croatia, right, two different ethnic groups, the Serbs said, actually, no, we're independent. All right, we're not going to be part of Croatia. We're going to declare this the Serb Kraina. And Gotovina was the general who said, no, you're not. Uh, and he basically tried to get the Serbs out of there. 
And as the leader of this military operation called Operation Storm, the result was the pillage and plunder and murder of many, many Serbs. It was quite destructive. And he, on the Serb side, is sort of seen as, a, as an evil man. And this case in front of the Yugoslav tribunal was a really big deal because the majority of defendants at the tribunal were Serbs. Okay? So the tribunal in, for Yugoslavia has been seen as this sort of anti-Serb international campaign. Right? Most of the trials are against Serb leaders. They're saying, Serbs, you were terrible to the Muslims. You were terrible to the Croats. We're going to blame you for the war. Right? So it's victor's justice, only the Dayton Peace Accords, there wasn't any clear victor. Okay? All right, so Gotovina is like the Croatian guy who's on trial. And so the idea was if the Croat is found guilty, then we can sort of equalize the blame for this war. And that was considered really important, right? The tribunal was supposed to say what happened. We don't want victor's justice. We want to say that there were all people doing bad things. We want to individualize guilt, not make it one ethnic group against another. Well, Gotovina was found guilty in the trial chamber, which was considered for the Serbs great, for the Croats horrible. They were like, he was our military leader. Why are you holding him criminally guilty for doing what needed to be done militarily, right, to keep Croatia safe? Um, the appeals chamber overturned the trial chamber and actually said that Gotovina was not guilty. And in fact, what he did was part of a military campaign. Um, and and um, the in, what it came down to was whether the shelling of the towns after, during the military campaign was indiscriminate, right? Did they indiscriminately shoot up towns to get the Serbs to leave, right? Uh, and they found him not guilty. The common plan that they were looking for, right, the crime was getting all the Serbs out, right, expelling the Serbs. That's considered a crime, right? That's a crime against humanity, getting all the Serbs out. Um, and the question was, was he... Did, did he have that? Did he want that to happen? Um, and the way they tried to show it is, did he indiscriminately shell? And they used this really interesting legal thing where they said, well, was the shelling more or less than 200 meters? Completely random fiction. And they said, no, the shelling was not indiscriminate because it, it, was, it was over 200 meters away from some of the targets. So, I mean, um, I'm sorry, under 200 meters away from the targets. So that means it was not indiscriminate complicated legal terms, I know, but essentially what they said was Gotovina's, what he did was militarily justifiable, he shouldn't be found guilty, um, and this was, um, this was, this is a real problem in the Balkans, okay? This really undermined the legitimacy of the tribunal to many people in the Balkans. Um, this guy on the right um, is a man named Perisic, and this also becomes important. He was convicted, um, he, was a, he was a leader in the Yugoslav army, he was a leader in Serbia, um, and he gave arms to the Bosnian Serb militia that committed um, a massacre that's called a genocide. And the question was, as a leader, a military leader, is giving arms, does that let you be held liable, right? Can he be held liable because he gave arms to this particular military group that then indiscriminately killed people, that, that then committed what is now called a genocide? Um, in Srebrenica, and the trial chamber actually, the, the, the appeals chamber said no, in fact, uh, giving arms does not make him liable, okay? Because he didn't specifically intend for those arms to be used uh, to kill 10,000 um, Muslim boys and men that was later declared a genocide. So he's not guilty because giving arms wasn't enough of an intent, right? Um, so those of us that are sort of like, how can we use international criminal law to sort of, you know, get the arms dealers and all of these things, start to see some of the challenges that we're having in international criminal law right now. All right, so um, ICTY outcomes, uh, they've, it's really reified divisions between ethnic groups, okay? So basically what's going on in the former Yugoslavia where I spent a lot of time is there was a, you know, this conflict ended in 95, there were no clear winners and losers, and the tribunal has basically tried to say that the Serbs were the bad guys. Every time a conviction comes out that isn't enough, doesn't have enough jail time, the, the Muslim victims say, oh my God, we're re-victimized, the Serbs. Uh, anytime there is a conviction, say, look, they're, we're, they're making us pariahs and we're not. The Croats get to say we didn't do anything wrong, we're not at fault, and it's really reified these divisions. Moreover, um, Bosnia and Herzegovina um, is, is a country that uh, has Bosnian Muslims and it has Bosnian Serbs, 
and they're being asked to live together, and one group has been declared genocide victims, and one group has been declared genocidaires, and that makes it really hard to have a country that actually is coherent, and I can talk more about that. Um, so there are ongoing complaints about political bias in the tribunal. It's really illegitimate, basically. Study after study shows that the tribunal in Yugoslavia is, is considered pretty illegitimate. If it's done anything, um, it's given sort of norms about justice, but when you have norms about justice and you're not actually seeing justice, it's not clear that that's always a good thing. Uh, it also cost uh, 20, 225 million dollars in counting, so it's really expensive. All right, so the idea of retribution in um, Yugoslavia hasn't gone so well. All right, uh, Rwanda. Um, uh, I want to talk about Rwanda because uh, Rwanda sort of tells us about the dilemmas of ensuring an accurate historical record. Okay, through international criminal law, which is one of the goals of international criminal law. Right? We're going to have courts, and they're going to sort of weigh the evidence and use the adversarial system, and we're going to get the right story. Okay? And Rwanda is a clear case of, eh, this didn't really happen. So if you look at where Rwanda is, um, it's, next, it's near Uganda, right? It's, it's, it's the Democratic Republic of Congo right next to it, and there, there it says Zaire, it's an old map. Um, and the war in Rwanda is... Um, basically related to an ethnic minority group, the Tutsis, who became a rebel group um, because the dominant majority group, uh, the Hutus, were persecuting them. Uh, and this was all an outgrowth of colonialism. Basically, when the colonial powers were there, they put the Tutsis in charge because they knew that would make it easier to control the country when the colonial powers left. Uh, the Hutus then took control and sort of exiled the Tutsis, right? So it was payback time. There's arguments that there is no definition, distinction between Tutsis and Hutus. It has to do with who herded cattle and who didn't. But, you know, we don't know. But there was this division that arose between Hutus and Tutsis. When, um, uh, during um, the conflict um, in 1994, basically the president of the country was shot down. No one really knows who it was, if it was Hutu extremists, because the Hutus were starting to negotiate with the Tutsis and bring them back into the government. Um, but the president, who was a Hutu, was shot down, and that was used as an excuse to slaughter the Tutsis. Okay? Um, and estimates between 500,000 and a million Tutsis were slaughtered within a period of three months. It's a much graver history. The saddest part is that Romeo Dallaire, who was the general, a Canadian, uh, was there. He asked if he could intervene, and the UN said, don't intervene, no military. We've already seen 10 peacekeepers be killed. We can't do a thing about it. And so Dallaire had to stand by and watch while this slaughter happened, and the UN couldn't do a thing. Okay. So we're in the, you know, the, the you know, you, uh, Yugoslavia is happening, everyone's seeing the tribunal, it looks like maybe this could help. So the Rwandan government goes to the new Rwandan government, which is the Tutsis, right? The Tutsis come back um, into power, and they basically say, uh, we really want an international criminal tribunal to sort of legitimate ourselves and to show how horrible this genocide was, right? And so international community, United Nations, come up with a tribunal for us. Um, and they wanted, you know, they said, look, we want to condemn genocide. Right? They want to avoid the appearance of victor's justice. Right? The new Tutsi government doesn't want to look like they're punishing the Hutus. They want the international community to do it. All right? They suggest that impunity impinges upon reconciliation. So this idea that if we have no justice, then we won't be able to get along. Right? Um, and they wanted access to leaders, um, Hutu leaders who were in foreign countries. Now eventually, after negotiating, uh, at the UN, and the UN comes up with a plan for a tribunal. They're going to put it in Arusha, Tanzania. They're going to try crimes um, that happened between January of 94 and June of 94. The government dissents, right? So the government dissents for some interesting reasons. They said um, they don't approve of the temporality, okay? So the Rwanda tribunal was only going to try crimes that were committed in a six-month period between January 1994 and June. And the Tutsi government says, ah, ah, we can't get the crimes that happened before. We can't get the incitement to genocide. How are we actually going to talk about why the genocide happened? So the government said, that's a problem. They also didn't approve of the composition, right? They wanted an independent prosecutor in appeals. So this, um, basically, the United Nations said, fine, we'll make a tribunal for you, but it's going to be tied to the Yugoslavia tribunal, okay? And the Rwandan leaders said, we don't want that. We want our own. The government feared that the genocide would be relegated to a lower level than war crimes, right? They thought that the idea of plunder was going to take precedence. They were worried judges would be from countries that were complicit, like Belgium, 
uh, its former colonial power, or France that supplied arms, right? There were all sorts of other countries that were involved in the Rwanda genocide. Um, they were worried that imprisonment would be outside of Rwanda. They were also worried that the tribunal would be outside of Rwanda, right? They said, if this is for Rwanda people, we should have it in Rwanda. They were also worried that lower level perpetrators, right, because these tribunals are only for high level perpetrators, they were worried lower level perpetrators in the Rwanda courts could get capital punishment because there was capital punishment in Rwanda, but not at the international tribunal. So for all of these reasons, the government of Rwanda was one of the few countries to vote against the creation of the tribunal in the Security Council. Okay? Now, regardless, the tribunal went forward. All right? I'm not going to go through everything uh, about the tribunal that was good or bad. There's some, there's some great stuff coming out of it. One of my next projects is going to be looking at the defense attorneys, many from the uh, Tribunal for Rwanda. They really did their best to get an accurate historical record through the, temp the fact that this uh, tribunal was so limited in its mandate, right? Only looking at crimes between January and June of that period. Now, what's the big deal about the accurate historical record here? Okay. The accurate historical record, the story of the Rwanda genocide, there has only been one narrative that has come forward, and that is that the Hutus were evil and they murdered 500,000 to a million Tutsis. Now, the Tutsi group, the RPF, has been accused of horrendous crimes, and none of them were allowed to be tried at the Tribunal for Rwanda, right? So none of the actions by the insurgent group, the Tutsi group, so it's been one narrative violence. Hutus committed genocide against the Tutsis, against, yeah, and that has been used for the government to sort of consolidate its power, right? So there's one set of victims, there's one set of perpetrators. So we have a really narrow understanding of what happened there, and we only have one crime. But here's the bigger deal. Using the term genocide as justification, okay? So that, remember, the, the new leadership in Rwanda is Tutsi, all right? The armies of Rwanda and Uganda have invaded the Congo, okay? And they've done this under, um, under the idea that there's uh, Hutu militias, okay, in the Congo, all right? And so the Rwandan government has said, well, look, we're victims of a genocide. It's okay. We can go into the Congo. Uh, and try to fight this. But here's the problem. Uh, the Rwandan government has been accused of killing uh, approximately 500,000 people um, in, in the Congo. Okay, um, It's responsible for the death and many more through displacement, malnutrition, and hunger. The UN has called it the Rwandan rape of the Congo. Okay, So um, the numbers speak to themselves, right? Rwandan diamond exports increased from 166 carats in 1998, 166 to 30,500 two years later, okay? So the Rwandan government has been able to present itself as the victims of a genocide, and that justifies their power. And using that, they've been able to go into their neighboring country saying, oh, look, those are the militias, right? Just to reiterate what they've been able to do with this definition of being a genocide victim, right? Big problem. The leader of Rwanda, Paul Kagame, who was the Tutsi leader um, of the RPF, um, he has been accused of killing his political leaders all over the world. Last year, the Globe and Mail did an expose on how Paul Kagame's henchmen went into South Africa and killed a man in a hotel who was fleeing Rwanda because he was just a political opponent, right? So the idea of them being genocide victims has been used to a really dangerous political advantage. All right. Um, I'm going to skip over issues of basic due process in international criminal tribunals, but you can imagine that when we're trying to get an accurate historical record, um, people have major incentives to perjure themselves, accuse people of being uh, committed. There were, there were 80,000 people in Rwanda that were accused of committing a genocide, right? So it's pretty hard to prove who did and who didn't, right? So neighbors rose up against neighbor for who knows what, for property crimes, for you know, marital crimes, whatever, and said, you committed genocide, and it's become a big issue. There's cultural differences, right? Victim testimony that sort of doesn't make any logical sense from a Western standpoint that enters the record, right? There's all sorts of huge issues, and there's always resource challenges, right? How can you actually get enough money to get these courts to do what they're supposed to do. There's been a second generation of international criminal law. So there have been two tribunals. I mentioned them, Sierra Leone and uh, Lebanon. These are the two other UN tribunals that are in international criminal law. We call them second generation. They have a pared down budget, a tightly focused mandate, a limited period of operation, and lack of institutional links to the Security Council. Um, the idea was we spent way too much money in Yugoslavia and Rwanda. 
uh, both of these tribunals suffer enormously from legitimacy issues. Okay, so the Special Court for Sierra Leone uh, has had some serious problems um, and, and been accused of really um, undermining the defense. And the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, many people in Lebanon don't even want it. I was in Lebanon last January. Um, I woke up to a car bomb that killed a political leader who had that morning tweeted about uh, Hamas, who's, who are the defendants in the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. And the rumors going around were his uh, opposition to Hamas and support for the Special Tribunal for Lebanon played a role in this. Rumors, anecdotes, no one knows why the man was killed, but we do know that Lebanon is a highly volatile situation, and the Special Tribunal is trying Hamas um, for, the crime, for a, a, the crime of international terrorism, which is actually a domestic crime, complicated, um, and it's, it's really, really problematic, all right? So I can talk about more of that in the Q&A, because I want to skip to the International Criminal Court. Okay, so many of us know about the International Criminal Court or we're interested in the International Criminal Court. Okay, so the International Criminal Court, um, the, after Nuremberg, the international law, there was a commission called the International Law Commission and it got together and it said, okay, what would an, a permanent court like Nuremberg look like? And they try, and they, they talked about this right after World War II, then comes the Cold War, gone. Right? No talk of an international criminal court during the Cold War. In 1989, the idea was revived. Um, and it was revived, interestingly, when Trinidad and Tobago came to the UN and said that we really need an international judicial forum for drug trafficking. That's the or origins of the International Criminal Court. It was for drug trafficking. All right? And so they, um, so, but after what happened in the Balkans, after what happened in Rwanda, um, the people who formulated the draft statute said, oh, we really should be doing more about genocide and crimes against humanity, right? So, so drug prosecution, trafficking off the charts, we're just going to focus on these crimes. Now, um, the ICC, the, the statute uh, to create, it's a treaty-based um, court. Uh, the treaty is called the Rome statute. The Rome statute sets out the mandate of the International Criminal Court. And uh, it was signed in 1998. It started, it, it formed, uh, it went into effect in 19, uh, 2002. Now there's a couple of countries that have signed it but not ratified it. Okay, the U.S. is the most famous. Uh, the others are Bahrain, Israel, becomes important, Kuwait, Thailand, Ukraine, which becomes important, uh, and Yemen in addition to the United States, who have signed and not ratified. The United States signed, but then under George Bush, unsigned, um, or something. Uh, you know, some, some senators say that it's, it's actually against our Constitution. That's what's going on in the Ukraine. Um, the Ukraine says that there's nothing in the Ukrainian Constitution that would allow for another court to have sovereignty. Um, and so that's, that it's actually the court, the, the High Court of Ukraine has said that, which is why. Mm -hmm. which is unconstitutional, maybe. Unsigning it or it? Signing a treaty that gives jurisdiction to, of national, of Ukraine nationals, especially the military, to a foreign court. That's unconstitutional. The Ukrainian high court has held. The, what you, about the U.S.? The, there are senators in the U.S. who say that we would need an amendment to the Constitution, right, to so it. to join it. That's a, that's a political argument, but that's the idea, that you would actually need to amend the constitutions of these countries. Um, that's the argument in the Ukraine and in the United States. Um, although the United States is it's much more political. That's just the sort of legal argument that some people, some senators make, um, that it's against our Constitution. Um, there's also parties that are non-parties and non-signatories. They said, we don't even want to pretend that we're going to sign it, okay? That includes China, which is interesting, El Salvador, India, Indonesia, Iraq, Lebanon, uh, Malaysia, Nepal, Pakistan, Palestine, which is interesting, it makes it into this list because there's still questions about whether it's considered a state, um, which is a topic that is relevant, um, and Turkey. Okay, so um, just to describe a little bit about what makes the ICC so um, controversial, uh, mostly what it has to do is uh, with the role of the prosecutor. Okay, who can actually initiate uh, uh, an ICC? investigation, and an ICC investigation eventually becomes an ICC prosecution. There are three ways in which an ICC investigation can commence. The first is when the Security Council 
refers it, right? So the Security Council has to refer a matter to um, the, the ICC. Libya, for example, that's the, that's the um, that happened. Sudan, that happened, okay? Um, a state party, right? Most of, most of the ICC investigations are state parties. It's the Ugandan government going to the ICC and saying, we have a rebel army that is conscripting child soldiers and committing atrocities. Could you please investigate and prosecute, right? So that's the most of the ICC investigations are state parties. Um, but the third is a prosecutor. Um, and can the prosecutor initiate an investigation? And there's significant um, restrictions. The main restriction is complementarity. Is there enough going on domestically, right? So the ICC is, is supposed to be a court of last resort. It's supposed to come in after. You've exhausted all domestic remedies, right? That's the main one, okay? Um, and then there's all sorts of limitations, right? So um, the, uh, the Security Council could actually defer investigations or prosecutions for a year renewable, meaning the Security Council could defer investigations and prosecutions endlessly. Right, so the ICC was created to get the sort of politics of uh, human rights violations and, war and aggression and all these things out of the Security Council, but the Security Council retains significant control over it, right? Yeah. In that sense, could it be interpreted that the Security Council, uh, repeating year after year, the in practical veto to the International Criminal Code is as it has done it, the Security Council, preventing uh, United Nations resolutions on certain countries. And as an example, the Security Council prevented year after year the application of United Nations uh, resolutions on the crimes or actions of Israel against others. No, so these are totally different issues. So basically the point is that um, there has been no official investigation by the International Criminal Court into Israel, right? That, what you're describing is a separate issue with the Security Council. If the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court decided that she, now it's a she, before it was a he, wanted to investigate Israel, they would, the Security Council could say you have to wait a year. And again, and again, and again. But that first step hasn't been taken. So there's not a relationship. What you're describing isn't related to the International Criminal Court. There are investigations that are separate from the International Criminal Court that the United Nations is engaged in. Yeah? What I see as related is that in the Security Council, as far as I do understand, is the same Security Council permanent member who always postponed the International Criminal Court from actions and always blocks or vetoes the General Assembly resolution on Israel. Right, so these are two different issues. Again, what's happening is there are members of the Security Council that are blocking the Security Council referring the situation to the ICC. So it's not just with Israel, but also with Syria. China and Russia have blocked resolutions to refer the case. That's different, right? There have been resolutions. There's not been resolutions to refer the case necessarily, right? But that's what, that's what happens. It's about referring the case. And so if they did refer the case, then they could go back and say, actually, we want to postpone and postpone and postpone. But first, you have to refer the case to the ICC. Okay, so that's the first step we're talking about, right? And so one of the big issues here is that these cases don't get referred to the ICC because of the Security Council permanent members blocking the referral. The referral doesn't even get there, right? So um, that's different, right? What we're talking about here is when the prosecutor initiates it herself. The only case the prosecutor has initiated herself has been Kenya, okay? Has been Kenya, and that was due to electoral violence. And that has been highly political because there are great concerns that that violence in the wake of the electoral um, massacre rose to the level of international crimes, right? So we've gone over what constitutes an international crime. And the question that's, that's hitting everybody is, did the violence that happened in Kenya after the election constitute an international crime? And should the prosecutor have initiated uh, an investigation into that, and now a trial? Not only are there questions about whether or not she should have investigated that uh, particular issue, and her hands were tied, I can get into the history, but basically it was a, there was a, the, 
Kenya said, look, we're going to do our own court case and, you know, went to the ICC and the ICC said, well, if you do your own court case, we won't do anything. And then Kenya did nothing. Right. So then the ICC felt like, well, if we don't do something, we look bad. Um, but then they decided to do something and now they look pretty bad. Um, and they look they look really bad in Africa. So the biggest, you know, the the Kenya, the Kenya issue sort of yeah, I, I put the U.S. above. The, the court and I put Africa below because you have critiques coming from above, right? The U.S. doesn't want to join and mainly they don't want to join because they're worried about this crime of aggression, right? They're worried about a politically motivated prosecutor. Um, there were, they have signed bilateral agreements across the board. They've threatened to withdraw their peacekeepers from the U.N. if they were going to be liable under the International Criminal Court. They have done everything possible to make sure their military has no opportunity to be tried by the International Criminal Court. So you have them from above, and that's created serious issues, um, especially around the crime of aggression. Um, and then uh, there is no crime of aggression currently um, at the uh, International Criminal Court. It's in the statute, but there have to be amendments, and they're trying to figure out, uh, I can get into the details because I want to get through this quickly about um, they're trying to come up with new procedures basically for the crime of aggression which essentially make any member able to opt out of being liable for the crime of aggression okay so so the US has been pushing this no crime of aggression at the International Criminal Court pretty strongly um, Africa from below right that Kenya case from below Africa is putting pressure on the International Criminal Court okay so this Kenya case in addition to it being the first case where the prosecutor started it um, this is also the first case where a sitting head of state is on trial, right? And he's on trial. Okay, so the ICC indicted um, Al Bashir, who is a sitting head of state in Sudan, but no one would extradite him, right? So when when Bashir went to Uganda, who's a party to the ICC, the ICC said, "Please extradite, please extradite," and Uganda said, "No, we're not going to extradite him." Right, which was sort of a big slap in the face to the ICC. And now what you have is the sitting head of state um, of Afri in Kenya on trial, appeared actually today. Uh, and this trial is going on. Yeah. Sorry, why would it be extradited? Um, uh, Pan-African unity. And a sort of growing uh, consensus that the ICC targets Africans and African leaders. So there are 20 investigations from the ICC in eight African countries. So um, Africa for a while was the only country with investigations. It was uh, then Colombia is, is on its docket. And currently, um, the UK is actually being investigated by the ICC for uh, atrocities by British um, military men in Iraq. So they're starting to branch out. But for a long time, it was Africa. And when you asked the prosecutor, who is an African herself, Atu Ben Suda, she said, look, they're the ones referring to us. There are also 39 of the 122 signatories are African. And when you think about the idea of complementarity, which means did the country actually, uh, can it pursue, did they exhaust remedies? The argument is, well, the African countries have less resources and capacity. So of course, we're going to be in that we're going to be pursuing African cases, whereas Colombia can say we're pursuing it. Britain can say we're pursuing it, right? So that's sort of the pushback against the claim that the Africans say that you're targeting us. But so you're getting a lot of pushback from below, especially from Africa, push from above, right? So this makes it really difficult. All right, so just to conclude, what is this? Let's talk about these current conflicts. So what do we learn about why we're stuck, right? By getting a little sense of history, OK? All right, so Ukraine. First of all, you, no one's a party, OK? We, you know, uh, Ukraine's not a party, all right? Now, Ukraine has signed over jurisdiction um, to the International Criminal uh, Court. Um, but um, there's an argument that, um, that this is now becoming a political debate, right? So the legislature and the executive say the ICC can have jurisdiction, but the high court in um, Ukraine says it can't, right? So you're creating a sort of political issue there. There's also um, an issue that a, a, a scholar named Shearson has written about that says, actually, Russia might want ICC intervention. Um, the International Criminal Court has been investigating um, the war between Russia and Georgia, which occurred in August 2008. Russia is convinced that they were right and legally mandated to protect ethnic Russian civilians. So uh, there's some, some people who say Russia wouldn't be opposed, and they would be able to say, look, it's the Ukrainian nationalists that have been committing the atrocities. right?" So it's really not clear that ICC intervention is going to go the way of a lot of people who think that there's an incursion from Russia into Ukraine. All right. 
Um, and as I said, the, the crime of aggression has fallen by the wayside, right? So it's really going to be difficult to get any sort of action on this issue, um, given the development of international criminal law. In Syria, we have a really big issue, right? Um, we have, uh, currently we have non-state actors, right? We have ISIS and we have all of the issues around that. And so who actually can be held liable is really difficult. This is a non-international armed conflict, right? And that's been the claim of why there can be no intervention, right? So under international law, you cannot intervene if it's not international. Um, so uh, you have an internal armed conflict. Um, as, we, as I said, you have an ICC that is bound by the Security Council and Russia and China are fully on the side of, of the president of Syria and won't sign, uh, refer this. There's obviously going to be no self-referral. Um, uh, and um, there, I was asked a question by email, someone who, I don't know if they're here, but they wanted to know about the chemical weapons issue, um, whether that, you know, what does that have to do with this? Um, and the chemical weapons issue in and of itself, um, legally it's technical. Um, chemical weapons uh, are considered a violation of war crimes, but war crimes are usually international armed conflict, right? And this is a non-international armed conflict. So it would have to be a crime against humanity, um, which is okay um, if it rose to that level. Um, but that's going to be difficult. The main issue is that this is an internal armed conflict, okay? And no one's referring the case. Um, the issue of Iraq, interestingly in 2006, um, there were 240 complaints about the invasion sent to the ICC, mostly from the US and the United Kingdom, okay? Um, and the prosecutor at the time, Luis Moreno Ocampo, uh, explained that um, although we, we have a crime of aggression in the statute, um, we actually can't exercise jurisdiction over that crime, right? We can't, it was 2006, they still can't, right? We've had the Kampala Amendments in 2010, which tried to codify it, but uh, based, you need to have a certain number ratifying and we don't have it. Um, so anyway, we can't have jurisdiction over the crime of aggression, okay? Um, in addition, um, they, uh, they're worried about, um, they said it didn't, they, it didn't meet the gravity requirement at the time in 2006, although now I think that's sort of, we get that it rises to the gravity issue. Um, but the main issue has to do with sort of the aggression um, and the other issues with the United States sort of stacking the cards so that it won't be held liable. Now the Gaza conflict is incredibly tricky, um, mostly because of the legal status of Palestine as a non-state. Humanitarian law doesn't really know what to do. Who is a civilian and who is military? All right, this is a big issue. I've had good conversations with really, with people um, who, who really want to claim, look, the, the people who are in the mosques and the schools should be considered um, sort of part of that common plan or purpose, right? Because uh, they're aiding and abetting, right? So there's, there's all sorts of ways in which that broadening of liability can bring in civilians right, and people who are sort of participating but maybe not willingly, right, so sort of the, the underside of that broadening of liability, which was important to get the big fish, is that you can sort of scoop up other people and say that they're somehow responsible, um, and then they can become targets. Um, that's just a, you know, just a, a broad, broad concern. I know that I have when you start to sort of broaden it, who, like, who gets caught um, when you widen the net too much. Um, interestingly, um, so, uh, so we just don't know what's going to happen there with the state issue. Um, Palestine has applied to get uh, status as a state. The ICC has rejected it, right? So Palestine cannot refer this to the International Criminal Court. Israel certainly isn't going to. It doesn't want ICC intervention in anything. Um, and so basically we're sort of at, uh, we're at a standstill really in terms of what international criminal law can do around these issues. Um, and, and you can see that sort of the history and the development helps us understand why. Um, yeah, so, you know, the current dilemma is aggression, the relationship with the Security Council, who's a member or not, and general legitimacy of international criminal law. So I say, you know, what's our assessment, right? How much, is it, how much has international criminal law really been able to sort of do what it was supposed to do in terms of retribution? How much has it been able to really create an accurate historical record of really messy things? Um, how much has it been able to deter violence? I don't know. So I was going to conclude on sort of a happy note, like, so what are some alternatives? Um, there's domestic prosecutions, right? So some of these countries have instigated, you know, started their own prosecutions, and 
Those have all of the benefits and the drawbacks that you can imagine, right? So it's domestic, so it's local, but that also means it's pretty biased. These, these histories are really complex. There's a good guy and a bad guy. Um, it's, it's quite difficult to do fair domestic prosecutions. And really, these countries that this kind of violence happens to, if they weren't poor to begin with, have become poor, right? So they don't actually have the resources to do the kinds of prosecutions they need to do. Third state prosecutions, this is universal jurisdiction. Right, so Belgium, um, in the wake of the Rwanda War, had uh, a, a man accused of uh, several people accused of genocide uh, in, in Belgium, and they were found guilty, and three of the four were put in jail. Um, so this has happened. It's uh, quite political and quite problematic. Universal jurisdiction um, became quite widespread, and it's sort of constricted. Canada actually has its own policies on this, um, and it usually ties uh, this to immigration, right? So if you have a suspected war criminal on Canadian soil, you're going to go through deportation hearings. And that's kind of where Canada exercises uh, universal jurisdiction, which is basically that a crime that is so heinous like uh, genocide, we should be able to try in domestic courts. That's the idea of universal jurisdiction. It doesn't matter if it's territorially tied to, to Canada. It doesn't matter if the person who committed it is Canadian or the victim is Canadian. It's so heinous we're going to try it. That's the idea of universal jurisdiction. So that's, that's sort of one push. Because you know, people in this field know that we're not getting very far with international criminal law. Truth Commission is my expertise. i um, happy to talk about that in the Q&A. This is sort of, you know, can we get an accurate historical record? Forget punishment. Let's just try to get people saying what happened. Uh, some people apologizing. It has its own issues. Um, and then community justice mechanisms, right? So what about local efforts? Um, take it out of the court, uh, let's do sort of restorative justice programs. Those are also being tried. They also have you know, limitations that I'm perfectly happy to talk about. Mainly, um, community justice mechanisms were never, never used to deal with issues like uh, genocide and crimes against humanity and war crimes. These tended to be mechanisms that were for civil crimes, property damage, um, family disputes, right? And they're trying now um, to be used for these kinds of mass atrocities, and that's problematic in and of itself, okay? And I will stop. Great.